Stop what you're doing and stop Spider-Man. You? Wait, you? Welcome back, everyone. This will be my full breakdown and Easter eggs for Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. There were a billion references, a bunch of cameo scenes to pretty much every single version of Spider-Man from the comics, from all the previous movies, even some of the spin-off movies like the Venom movies, as well as all the animated series as well, too. You can watch the movie a thousand times and still find new stuff. So if you're brand new to the channel, be sure to subscribe to get all the videos. We're still giving away tickets to the movie. All you have to do to enter is be a subscriber and just leave your favorite Easter egg from the movie in the comments. Careful for spoilers for the movie if you haven't seen it yet because we'll be talking about everything that happens. Just starting at the beginning and working our way through shot by shot, talking about Easter eggs and WTF moments as we go along. The Sony title glitches the same way it did during the first movie. One of them is the font from the Miles Morales original comic book where he debuted. The bubble effect they use here, they use it several times in the movie, is called the Kirby Crackle. They use it during the first movie too. It was just Jack Kirby's way in the classic comics of animating cosmic energy. They also use it during the Marvel What If series too. There are a lot of similar tropes that they use in What If that they use in this movie too with the blend of live action elements and animated elements like it's all canon to the multiverse. These are just other universes where everything happens to be animated like in Doctor Strange Multiverse of Madness. The other Sony logos are all meant to be versions from old Spider-Man TV shows like the classic TV shows, the classic comic books. They're older real life versions of the Sony and Columbia Pictures logo too from black and white like real world history when Columbia Pictures started. The same is true for the Marvel logo too, like they flash between several different variants of the Marvel logo because there have been so many other versions of Spider-Man movies as well as Spider-Man comic books and Spider-Man TV shows. There are meant to be about 280 total different versions of Spider-Man in the movie, but only about 95 of them are actually official versions from the comics and only a handful of those actually have speaking lines. These name tags are also based on a combination of the comic book logos from the different versions of Spider-Man in the movie and the name tag convention from the first movie when all the different versions were introducing themselves, retelling the same origin story like, let's do this one last time. All right, let's do this one last time. They even have a version of the classic Marvel Secret Wars logo because some of the plot mirrors the events of the classic Secret Wars in the multiverse. There's also a rumor that we're going to see some Spider-Verse characters cross over in Avengers 6 Secret Wars when they do that in the MCU movies. There were a bunch of MCU crossover moments and scenes during this movie too. Pretty much everybody had theories about what might be in this movie and everyone wound up being correct. Like the craziest theories all wound up paying off in some small way. During the Lord and Miller producer titles, it also flashes to a real world classic coat of arms version with a bunch of real pictures of them making funny faces. The approved by the Comics Code Authority logo is also taken from real life comics. It was used as a symbol on comics for a governing body that deemed things appropriate for mass consumption back in the 1950s. They were meant to be sort of like an MPAA ratings agency, like you rate movies, rated R, or like rated for adults or however it is in your country. In the United States, Congress got really upset with the quality of comics in the 1950s and said it was polluting, it was corrupting the youth, basically regulating comics. In the movie, you could kind of think of the Spider Force as being like that, but for the multiverse, like Spider-Man 2099 is deeming Miles Morales to be inappropriate in a danger to the multiverse. So he needs to be either locked up or they need to somehow undo him becoming Spider-Man. The opening scene is also meant to be very different in that the movie starts with Spider-Gwen on her Earth showing her backstory with a bunch of scenes incorporating the events of the entire movie. Like she basically tells you how the entire movie is going to play out here in this opening scene. Her voiceover starts with her saying, let's do things differently because it is very different. Both in what she's talking about, the way they animate it, and just thematically in the movie. From the earlier introduction scenes during the first movie. It's also meant to flow with the whole idea in the movie that Nexus events, like changing the canon events, they call it canon in the movie, but it's another word for Nexus event. It's like the TVA during the Loki series trying to stop Nexus events, people from changing the timeline in ways that will cause the destruction of that universe or cause very bad things to happen. And during the movie, Gwen changes history on her Earth with Miles Morales' help. Her father, Captain Stacy, winds up quitting his job and therefore doesn't wind up being killed like he's supposed to be in the canon. And it does not lead to the destruction of her universe like Spider-Man 2099 thinks that it will. So they're basically starting the movie by saying it's okay to do things differently and it's meant to be the theme of the entire movie. Like Miles Morales is okay existing and it's not going to cause the multiverse to collapse. 
The animation style on her Earth is mostly in pastels. The music is a big part of her life. So the beat of the music, the colors all change every time her mood changes. So that's why every time when she's in scenes on her Earth, all the things around her start shifting around. During this movie, just in general, she's meant to be a much bigger character than the first movie. I'd argue that she's like the second main lead because the things that she does drive the plot just as much as what Miles Morales is doing during the movie. A lot of the scenes are actually things that happen in the future of the movie, so it's almost like they're taking her narrating her backstory, but it's after the movie takes place and they just put this at the beginning of the movie. When she says that Miles is not the only one who's had it hard, that's because her origin story involves something similar where she's blamed wrongly for the death of her Peter Parker, just like Spider-Man 2099 wrongly blames Miles for the death of his Peter Parker. Her band makes fun of her calling her Def Leppard because of her crazy long drum solo while she's narrating this early scene. On her Earth, she also goes to the Visions high school that Miles goes to on his Earth, which she pretended to go to briefly when she was trying to figure out what was going on on his Earth. The 1990 banner behind them is a reference to the Peter Parker Spider-Man comic that ran from 1990 to 1998 because she, like Miles Morales, is one of the newer versions of Spider-Man who weren't created till much more recently in the comics. One of the main things that happened during that run in particular was Ben Riley was really big during that. During the movie, Ben Riley Scarlet Spider is played by Andy Samberg, who plays it mostly for comedy, like he's a super emo character that always speaks this really overly dramatic kind of hammy internal monologue like you would read in comic book thought bubbles. Well, I heard about the new Spider-Man movie, figured I would audition, maybe catch that part in my web. Baby, aren't you just redoing the same monologue that Kirsten Dunst did like 10 years ago? Uh, yeah, aren't you just redoing the exact same Spider-Man movie from 10 years ago? <laughs> the reason her Earth is number 65 is because the original Gwen Stacy debuted in the Amazing Spider-Man comics in the year 1965. The other apropos Easter egg here too is that her band's name are the Mary Janes because in the original Amazing Spider-Man comics, Gwen Stacy was Spider-Man's original love interest. Mary Jane had a brief cameo scene in that same year in 1965 when Gwen Stacy debuted, but Mary Jane didn't really become a big character until a couple years later in 1967. So she came along a little bit later, even though if you look at like the entire history of Spider-Man comics, they've been writing her as Spider-Man's love interest for a longer in duration, but technically Gwen Stacy came first. Her comment about never finding the right band to be in is a reference to her own Spider-Force team that she puts together at the end of the movie to go save Miles Morales made up of the team from the first movie in addition to Spider-Man India, Spider-Bite, and Hobie Brown Spider-Punk. If you're not familiar with Spider-Gwen's origin story, this is also based on the comics too. Her version of Peter Parker actually became a version of the lizard taking a serum and wound up leading to his own death like he caused his own death. If he sounded familiar, her Peter Parker was actually voiced by Jack Quaid, very small voiceover cameo scene. And Gwen's relationship with her father, I think, is also meant to be a metaphor, like a template for how Miles Morales' relationship with Spider-Man 2099 will ultimately play out, where first her father blames Spider-Woman for the death of Peter Parker, but eventually, once he learns the truth, he comes around on her. I think Spider-Man 2099 will eventually come around on Miles Morales by the end of Spider-Man Beyond the Spider-Verse. There's a real quick blink and you'll miss it J. Jonah Jameson cameo scene voiced by J.K. Simmons. He has a bunch of cameo scenes in different universes like it's always J.K. Simmons coming back as an alternate version of J. Jonah Jameson and most of them are closer to the version that you see during Spider-Man No Way Home in the MCU where the Daily Bugle is more of like a online news organization and he's more of like a TV pundit. The only one that we see that's actually still the Daily Bugle newspaper in that version of the character is actually in Lego Spider-Man's universe. Don't worry, I'll talk about him when we get to that part of the movie because that was a pretty cool Easter egg. Her father, Captain Stacy, is played by Shay Winningham. He's the alternate universe version of the same character that Dennis Leary plays in the Amazing Spider-Man Andrew Garfield movies, who both wind up having cameo scenes later. You also notice during the movie that she goes from wearing the ballet shoes to wearing the Chuck Taylors that belong to Spider-Punk. While she's still heading to stop the vulture, J. Jonah Jameson also starts talking about how the Sinister Six in this universe is starting to call the shots take over in her universe. A lot of Sinister Six characters that also show up during the movie too, different versions from the classic comics from the TV shows and the live action versions too. They're attacked by an alternate universe version of the vulture from a Leonardo da Vinci inspired universe where everything is old timey, it looks like it's based on parchment, like he's a parchment based person. When he moves around, the weapons he uses, all based on Leonardo da Vinci-like technology, he's also Italian, like da Vinci was. When she's fighting him, Gwen makes a Mario Kart Super Mario reference. 
I believe the Vulture's criminal number, like 99 here, reference to Amazing Spider-Man 99, which was a Gwen Stacy-like adventure where things played in a slightly similar type of way, but for Spider-Man. Most of the time when you see numbers on screen in movies like this, they're references to something. So let me know in the comments what you think these are references to. When she jokes about his cousin here, I believe this is meant to be a version of Isaac Newton, who wasn't actually Da Vinci's cousin in real life, just another scientific genius from a couple hundred years later in history. Spider-Man 2099 enters from the Spider-Force to capture him, played by Oscar Isaac, who's also Moon Knight in the MCU. And even though I didn't say it, obviously Spider-Gwen is played by Haley Steinfeld, who is also a version of Kate Bishop. There are many, many actors in this movie playing characters who are either also characters inside the MCU live action movies or are playing the same versions from those live action MCU movies. Maybe someday we'll see a live action version of Spider-Man 2099. That would be really cool. The only thing that they've changed since the Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse post credit scene about his character is just make his character model seem way more monstrous, like he's way bigger and way more hardcore looking. His real name in the comics is Miguel O'Hara. He's from the year 2099, and that version of New York City has become Nueva York. He works for Alchemax, which they reference in the movies several times. And the accident that turned him into Spider-Man was more like a mutation, so his powers are a little bit different too. Like he has an actual spider bite ability, where he can actually paralyze villains, which he tries to do to the vulture before the police in this universe stop him. He doesn't have those hairs that help him stick to walls and stick upside down like all the other versions of Spider-Man, but he's got these hardcore talons which he uses to rip into things. His web shooters are also energy based and he has a cape that he can form that will help him glide through the air. He's the one who made the webware wristwatches like all the technology in the movie is from his universe. They reference the Blue Panther, which is a Black Panther joke, the Caped Crusader, which is a Batman joke making a DC reference like the Caped Crusader, Dark Garfield, Macho Libre because he's Hispanic like Nacho Libre or Lucha Libre. When he narrates his origin story, there's a cover from Spider-Man 2099 number one. In real life, all the comic book covers are usually from real life with a few exceptions. Like Miles Morales is done with his symbol from the first movie. In some of the scenes on the comic book covers are scenes directly from the movie. But like you see all these other comic book covers denoting the other characters from the first movie usually. All of his cut twos are also done as comic book panels too. And usually when they flip through the pages of all these different comic books, when people are narrating their origin stories or they have different scenes like this, they are pages directly copied from real life. Like you could actually open up a comic book and read these pages. When he starts yelling at her, he references the events of the first movie with Kingpin's collider exploding because as he reveals later, he knows everything that's happened. His whole reason for making the Spider-Force team was to clean up the tears in the multiverse, the Spider-Verse, so to speak, like the Nexus events caused as a result of the first movie. The Spider-Force is basically like the TVA, but a bunch of versions of Spider-Man doing it. They even literally use the same depiction of the multiverse, these different timelines that they do during the Loki series. They explained during the first movie that the spider that bit Miles turning him into Spider-Man was from Earth-42, a different universe, and it led to this domino effect where more and more multiverse tears Nexus events started happening and all of reality became threatened. He also references the events of Spider-Man No Way Home and Doctor Strange's spells when he calls Tom Holland Spider-Man the nerd from Earth-19999 and Gwen makes more jokes about Doctor Strange being a bad doctor who maybe shouldn't practice medicine. Part of the reason why they're doing this is because a long time ago, there was Marvel TV and Marvel Studios, like it was two completely different groups of people, and the Marvel TV people canonized the live action stuff is Earth-19999. When they did the first Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse movie, they said that Peter B. Parker was from Earth-616, which is the traditional Marvel comic book universe, but in the last few Marvel movies, Kevin Feige has been saying that the MCU is Earth-616. So I think the larger reason why they say that MCU is Earth-1999 in this movie is just because they did that in the first movie. They said that Peter B. Parker's universe was 616 instead of the MCU. It's not like they're trying to change canon or anything like that. Originally, Earth-616 was meant to be the universe of the official Marvel comics, like the main timeline in the Marvel comic book universe. So they wanted to say in the first movie that Peter B. Parker was meant to be the original comic book Spider-Man. When he mentions hammer space, that's actually a spider ham reference. It's where he keeps all of his hammers, like his giant comic booky devices that he just whips out on a dime because they're so huge. Like where would he pull them out from? It's this interdimensional infinite space. You also notice throughout the movie, and this is true for a lot of characters, different scenes, is that they'll have little notes and thought bubbles that you see like they were written in an actual comic. 
Lila is his digital assistant, kind of like his version of Jarvis or Friday, played by Jenny Slate. She was also in the post credit scene for the first movie. Then they introduce the new version of Jessica Drew, Spider-Woman, played by Issa Rae. She's super pregnant, like Jessica Drew was in the comics. They have a similar type of costume. It's a little bit different, except she rides a motorcycle she uses in combat. There was a reference to Jessica Drew in the first movie, but it was the version from Miles Morales' original universe, and it was a slightly different version of the character just in general. They allow Gwen to come back to the Spider Force with them after they see she's about to be arrested by her father and things are going terribly in her universe. She also reveals her identity to her father, which sets off the change in the continuity of the canon of her universe, creating a Nexus event that allows him to survive because he quits the police force, creating proof that they can change things from the canon, like they can create these kinds of Nexus events and it won't destroy the entire multiverse. So Miles Morales does not need to be locked up for the rest of all time. They had the rest of the opening titles, and the drawings this time are all meant to be from Miles Morales' original art style, like he drew these, depicting the events of the first movie. A couple of months go by, and we pick up with him in his second year at high school, but he's still about 15 years old during the events of this movie. It's meant to have been about a year since the events of the first movie. This time, he gets his own version of that one last time speech narrating his backstory with a montage of the previous movie and his adventures since the first movie with jokes about how he's doing great, but it's meant to be ironic compared to the other versions of Spider-Man because he's kind of botching his saves. Like he takes down the bills, he usually catches them, but he causes so much collateral damage because he's still learning how to be Spider-Man, even though he's gotten much better since the events of the first movie. The number 42 that shows up here is another reference to that original spider that bit him from Universe 42. It's also the number on Miles' Brooklyn jersey, which is a Jackie Robinson Brooklyn Dodgers reference. Another cool MCU connection is that Jackie Robinson was played by Black Panther Chadwick Boseman in the movie 42, which also starred Harrison Ford, who is now the recast version of Thunderbolt Ross in the MCU. This time his comic reads number two to represent year two like it's his second movie and he gets a couple other comic covers later in the movie and the number goes up each time he gets a new comic book. While he's narrating his intro scene, they also cut it with the scene of his parents meeting his school counselor talking about college admissions. I fully expect that he will stay within the New York City area, like the larger New York City area, because he wants to go to Princeton, which is close enough by that he could continue to have adventures as Spider-Man in the New York City area. And they'll just continue making animated Spider-Verse movies after Spider-Man Beyond the Spider-Verse, even though right now they're talking about doing live-action Miles Morales movies. I just did a video about that, so I'll link it in the description below, but they did confirm that they are developing live-action Miles Morales stuff. If you couldn't tell, his school counselor is played by Rachel Dratch. Her name has web in it, like more spider puns. They also cut the intro scenes with the Spots debut trying to rob the bodega in a funny way the spot played by Jason Schwartzman he's meant to be the real main villain of this movie and the beyond the spider-verse movie he's also based on the comic book version of the spot named Jonathan Owen within the context of the movie he was a scientist working on Kingpin super collider when it blew up giving him his powers he's also the person who brought that spider from earth 42 that bit miles so that's why he says later in the movie you created me and I created you which is also a line of dialogue inspired by the Michael Keaton Batman 1989 movie with the Joker. You idiot! You made me. I made you. You made me first. Spot also says that he was the same scientist in the cafeteria in the first movie that they hit with the bagel, which they had that funny animation like the emote that said bagel. They do that for a lot of the different emotes in the movie when characters do things. It's a very comic booky way of depicting sounds in the movie or actions. The whole idea here is that he just starts as this petty criminal, like he's only turned to crime because he can't get a real job, like he tried to get a real job and can't because he looks like this. He's not meant to be particularly evil, just misguided. Then as he slowly realizes how he can use his powers to change the multiverse, and he feels slighted by Miles Morales, who calls him a villain of the week, Spider-Gwen also calls him a villain of the week, he grows to hate Miles, thinking that Miles is responsible for taking his life from him, like all these bad things are happening to him and it's Miles' fault for some reason and by the end of the movie threatens to destroy all of reality, which is a little bit like the Beyonders during the more recent version of Secret Wars in the comics. Like he's going to collapse, like destroy the entire multiverse, then remake it the way that he wants it to be. When he's trying to rob the bodega here at the beginning, the owner, Pepe Orsco, is actually played by Ziggy Marley, the son of musician Bob Marley in real life. 
There was another joke about money in Miles Morales' universe during the first movie, like they had crazy high prices, so I think the idea is that inflation is just out of control in Miles' universe. I couldn't quite tell whose face was on the money in his universe, so let me know in the comments if you think you know who this is. During their fight here, as they're walking around the store, you also notice the magazine rack is full of magazines with Miles Morales on the cover, depicting his adventures in the past year. Miles is correct when he says it is weird that people call them ATM machines because ATM literally stands for automatic teller machine, so it's like saying automatic teller machine machine, and the joke is meant to foreshadow the Spider-Man India joke where he calls chai, chai tea, like chai means tea, so you're calling it TT basically. For a cup of chai with my my auntie. I love chai tea. What did you just say? Chai tea? Chai means tea, bro. You're saying tea tea. Would I ask you for a coffee coffee with room for cream cream? No. No. You also notice in the bodega, and this is also true for pretty much every other food or drink item in Miles Morales' universe, everything has generic names, like the paper towels are called wipe. His energy drink is literally called energy drink. That's also probably for copyright reasons, too. When Miles starts narrating the adventures that he's had in the past and they start doing the montage of different villains, this one seems like a monster. It could be a version of Tombstone because the other ones are from the comics too. He fought Frogman, who is from the comics. They featured him during She-Hulk. I think this one is meant to be one of the other prowlers for the comics. There were several others that wore the mantle besides his uncle Aaron Davis. So it's probably just one of the other ones. He fought a version of Craven on his Earth. There's a live-action Craven the Hunter movie coming later this year with Aaron Taylor Johnson. It's connected to the Venom movies and Morbius. It'll also be rated R. When they show the montage of the new suits that he's creating, that he's designing here, these are all meant to be based on comic book designs. In his universe, he says his Aunt May moved to Florida. I'm assuming because he's helping her in his Spider-Man costume, she also continued to give him access to Peter Parker's Spider-Man lair there because they never addressed that during the movie, so either she moved it to Florida with her, or they just left it there for him to use. He hosts Jeopardy, and if you notice here, all the categories are Spider-Man references. The baby powder apology joke is based on something that happened in real life. It was a huge debacle. It was discovered a Johnson & Johnson baby powder product was causing cancer in infants. This was a real thing that happened, and they had to make this huge settlement. The celebrity endorsement fail is also a bit of a crypto joke, I think, because a bunch of celebrities are now being clowned on and part of a huge lawsuit because of how crypto tanked and a ton of people lost piles of money and a lot of it came through a lot of these celebrity endorsements. You also notice in the YouTube comments on his apology video, someone commented, I hear the powder was made from actual babies, which sounds very much like a typical YouTube comment. You get a lot of those on videos, like a lot of really weird stuff. There's also the whole concept of the YouTube apology video, which is like a huge trope in real life now. You're almost not a real YouTuber if you haven't made a bunch of apology videos about something. His YouTube channel is named The Mic Drop, where he posts these Spider-Man videos of himself. Miss Marvel in the MCU also has her own YouTube channel called Sloth Baby Productions, where she posts her Avengers fan movies that she makes at home. He made an apology video later, also for his lame mustache that he tried to grow, which is like a very teenager kind of thing to do. Like, look, I can grow a mustache, but it's a terrible mustache. I'm not sure who this giant robot is supposed to be, but I think it's based on something from the comics. The new twist that he talks about with his Spider-Man Venom ability is the Spider Stinger. That's also a comic book thing. It's his electrical shock ability. He used it during the first movie. It's just gotten better at it since then. And Hobie Brown Spider-Punk also teaches him how to use it in a more powerful way, too. It allows him to absorb electrical energy and redirect it, which he uses to destroy Spider-Man 2099's force field and drain the energy from his suit and blast him with it. Early theory too, he might be able to use this Venom Stinger ability to depower the spot because the spot is essentially an energy-based villain. It's just dark matter energy. In Miles' universe, they show his version of J. Jonah Jameson yelling about him being terrible, just like MCU Spider-Man. When he fantasizes about telling his parents his secret identity and says maybe in another universe they'd accept me, that actually winds up happening in Earth-42, where that version of his mother is fine with it. Since the events of the first movie, he's added Spider-Gwen and a bunch of the other characters, like pretty much the events of the entire first movie, to that mural where he was bitten by the spider originally. When he's trying to take the spot down, one of the little kids is also wearing a Miles Morales Halloween mask, which is a reference to his Peter Parker Spider-Man Halloween costume from the first movie, sold to him in the Stanley cameo scene. The other funny detail here, and later in the movie when he's traveling with the cakes, is that you notice that all the people around them could not be bothered, could not care less, that there are two super-powered individuals fighting in front of them. Like, nope, it's just another normal day in New York City in the Brooklyn area. 
And when he sees Genki, he's playing the Spider-Man PS4 game, but on a PS5, like it's a PS5 controller, which is funny for a couple reasons, because Spider-Man PS4 has a cameo in this movie. He's canon to the universe. It's kind of like the Super Mario movie with Mario playing games on a Nintendo console. He's wearing the Miles Morales edition Nike sneakers, like the Air Jordan sneakers. Nike made those in real life. I think the directors wore them to the premiere, and I think you might be able to buy them in real life. He also jokes about not being Miles' man in the chair. That's an MCU Ned Leeds joke who calls himself Tom Holland, MCU Spider-Man's man in the chair. Also in the comics and in the new PS5 Spider-Man 2 game, Genki becomes Miles' new man in the chair, helping him out on missions. I also just did a video for that new Spider-Man 2 trailer, so I'll link that below in the description too. When he's trying to give him reasons for not helping him out, he also references the spider signal and a bunch of other Spider-Man details from the comics and things that they've done in the MCU movies as well. One of the other things he uses here in this scene too is his camouflage ability. Not only does it render him invisible to the naked eye, it also works against other spider people's spidey senses. Like Spider-Gwen's spidey sense doesn't go off when he's right in front of her face. The counselor's speech about capturing every person's universe is a metaphor for the spider society capturing multiverse villains. The comment about having your cake and eating it too is a reference to the two cakes that he tries to make later and also foreshadowing for at the end of the next movie, like literally the end of part two beyond the Spider-Verse, they'll save the multiverse and Miles will be allowed to continue being Spider-Man and have his relationship with Spider-Gwen. They're basically telling you in this movie at the very beginning how everything is going to play out if you're looking at the clues. The joke about the B in Spanish is that he's half Hispanic, so his mother expects him to speak perfect Spanish. Technically, she's Puerto Rican, so when she snaps her fingers yelling at him, that's why it makes a little Puerto Rican flag emote. When they resume their fight, the portals take them back to Kingpin's Super Collider, where he finishes explaining his backstory and his relationship with Miles. There are more references to his father dying, too, which is a big theme in the movie as part of the whole Uncle Ben, Captain Stacy death montage later. The idea that they're all predestined to die, but Miles wants to change events so that his father lives in his universe. Gwen's father living proves that later in her universe as well. When he saves his father here at the beginning, he also saves him in the same way that the original Peter Parker saved Miles at the beginning of the first movie when they met for the first time, landing on the exact same platform. Like they kind of speed run, replay the events of the first movie in this scene here. When the spot starts narrating his backstory and what happened with the spider from Earth-42, the character with the braids who's in the class about to be bitten by that spider is that universe's version of Miles Morales, which we see at the end of the movie. They're basically trying to say that that spider was about to turn him into a version of Spider-Man, which is why his universe turned into like the Back to the Future 2 dark version of the universe because there was no Spider-Man to try and stop all these criminals. That's why Spider-Man 2099 and a lot of the other characters are trying to make Miles feel bad like it's his fault that things are going badly. Then the spot figures out how his powers really work with portals to the multiverse and he starts exploring the different universes with a whole bunch of cameo scenes and easter eggs. The very first one he goes to is based on the classic comics animated like the original Jack Kirby comics. The next one is the Lego universe with Lego Spider-Man who they reference is one of the most powerful best versions of Spider-Man on the team. This is also meant to just generally be a reference to Lord and Miller's Lego movies that he did with Chris Pratt. They made all the Lego movies. I think they also worked on the Batman Lego movie too, which was kind of like a spin-off. During this scene, there are a bunch of other details too, like it's a much longer scene. There's another J.K. Simmons, J. Jonah Jameson cameo scene, but this version is working at a Daily Bugle like it's an actual newspaper like the comics, and this version of Peter Parker started working for him. The headline in the background about Doc Ock still being at large I think is another Spider-Man 2 reference because there were headlines similar in that movie. The newspaper is called the Lego News which is weird because in their universe shouldn't they think that they're normal and not Lego creations. Maybe in their universe Lego is just like a random company that happens to own the newspaper and not a company that makes Lego toys. The other funny detail here from the Lego movies that they borrow is that when he contacts Spider-Man 2099, he makes the beep beep sound with his own voice just to give it that homemade vibe, kind of like the original Lego movies, like someone crafted this and they're making their own movie with Legos. When the spot says, the power of the multiverse in the power of my hand, that's also a reference to Dr. Octopus's line in Spider-Man 2. The power of the sun in the palm of my hand. He also gets a cameo scene later in the movie that I'll talk about because it's a little bit meta the way that they do it. 
Then he travels to the live-action Venom movie universe in Mrs. Chen's bodega, stealing a Venom mint from her, like stealing gum, which is also merch based on Tom Hardy's Venom. I love the way that they're blending the live-action and the animated elements. It's all canon through the multiverse. They did the same thing during What If. Like, this is all canon to the MCU. It just happens to be in different universes that are animated, not live action. When they go to the party, I'm not sure which card game these kids are playing. Let me know if you think you spotted it. On his way home with the cakes, he fights the armadillo, who is from the comics. The train fight is also another reference to Spider-Man 2, which they parodied in the first movie. You notice the criminal that he stops from stealing the shoes is stealing a bunch of Air Jordans. That's the brand of shoe that he's wearing, like his special custom Miles Morales edition Air Jordans. They show the mural of his uncle on the roof, foreshadowing the scene at the end on Earth-42, where it's of his father instead. While his father is giving a very ominous speech about his future always being around, being very dependable, I will never leave you, I will always help you. The other funny detail here too is when Miles is talking about his friends that left town, quote unquote, he's talking about his team from the first movie, he still calls Spider-Gwen Gowanda, and when they introduce them later, he still calls her Gwanda. His bedroom is filled with all kinds of pop culture references, like he reads the true tales of Spider-Man comics, which are based on the in-universe adventures of that original Peter Parker. The cover is also based on the original cover of Amazing Fantasy number 15, first appearance of Spider-Man. There's also a deleted scene here too we found out about. In the early versions of the movie, Miles Morales is meant to be an anime fan who collects My Hero Academia action figures. There was supposed to be a Deku action figure in place of the one that Spider-Gwen messes with. I'm guessing they swapped it in the final version just for copyright reasons, like they couldn't get approval or whatever to use Deku from My Hero. This is also a nice toy collector joke too, like she takes it out of the package, ruining its mint condition. In his scrapbook of drawings of her, he's also got a bus ticket that they used to get from Alchemax when he met her for the first time. The book that he's reading here, The Fire Next Time, is also a real-life book about civil rights. Her sweater, the Chuck Taylor she's wearing, were given to her by Spider-Punk, who's become her mentor since she joined the Spider-Force a few months ago. When he says her hair's gotten pinker, remember, the whole idea is that her colors change based on her mood. The pink shift is because she likes Miles. She's there to try and track down the spot for the Spider Forge, but she wanted to see Miles briefly. The way they talk about it later, too, it sounds like Spider-Man 2099 had always planned at some point to capture Miles Morales and just imprison him for the rest of his life. And they just forced Spider-Gwen to be quiet about it this whole time. Like, no, you're not allowed to visit him. You're not allowed to talk to him about it. During the montage of them catching up when they save the woman's purse, she also leaves a note that says, From your friendly neighborhood Spider-Woman, which is a reference to friendly neighborhood Spider-Man in the comics. You also notice that this universe version of FedEx is called Red X. I'm assuming they couldn't get permission from FedEx to use their logo in the movie. That happens all the time. That's also the reason why they use a lot of the generic names for a lot of these products. When she starts scoping out the spot, the building he's in has a billboard on top that says, All the O's always over the place, which is a reference to his spot portals being all over the multiverse. The bank that they're on also feels like a reference, like a nod to the bank fight scene in Spider-Man 2. She explains the part of the canon story relative to Gwen Stacy's of the multiverse. They always fall for a version of Spider-Man and it always ends badly. Him saying there's a first for everything is also a reference to them being able to change the Spider-Verse canon, change timelines, create nexus events without it destroying all of reality. Remember, it's all about having your cake and eating it too. That's the way they're going to end Spider-Man beyond the Spider-Verse. He will have his cake and eat it too. I'll let you guess what cake is a metaphor for. When his mother says she looks old enough to vote, that's just a joke about all the actors in the movie that are voicing characters being way older than the characters they play in the movie. Like, for instance, Haley Steinfeld, who voices Spider-Gwen, is in her 20s, as well as Shameik Moore, who's in his late 20s, and Miles Morales is meant to be like 15 during the movie. When Jessica Drew later starts talking about hanging out with people who were bad in her past or things going badly in her past, she's referencing Jessica Drew's comic book history with the High Evolutionary when he was still Herbert Edgar Wyndham before he became High Evolutionary. She was also brainwashed by Hydra when she was younger. We go to Spider-Man India's universe where his version of New York City is called Moombatten, which is a reference to Manhattan. He's also played by Karen Sony, who is also Dopinder in the Deadpool movies. He's coming back during Deadpool 3 too, so another actor who's a different character in the live-action MCU movies. The gag with his character is that he's super good at being Spider-Man, his life seems perfect, compared to all the problems that both Miles and Gwen have had in their lives. Miles also starts glitching out in his universe because he doesn't have the wrist device to prevent that yet. 
There's all kinds of jokes that are specific to Indian culture, like he uses a Latu device, he makes jokes about the crazy traffic everywhere, which you could say is common to most major cities in the Far East. He's also Indian, Miss Marvel is Pakistani, so two completely different cultures. Like a lot of the others, his comic book cover isn't from the real life Marvel Comics, but Spider-Man India is from Marvel Comics. This is his version of Green Goblin, they have the chai tea joke paying off the ATM joke from earlier. This is his universe's version of Gwen Stacy and her father who is the police captain. They also have a joke about the British Museum saying that this is where the British stole all our stuff which is a real life reference to British colonialism in India, they also kind of reference that during the Miss Marvel series too. He also makes the eat pray love joke about an American, the spot, coming to India and co-opting the culture, coming to steal something from India. The when the spot says that he's doing this because Miles made him feel empty, I think it's meant to be this cautionary tale like a metaphor for Miles' story with Spider-Man 2099 and ultimately Miles will wind up stopping the spot not only by using his Venom Stinger ability by like sucking a lot of the energy out of spot but also talking him down in a way that Spider-Man 2099 is not doing during this movie. Miles will see Spot's side of things and start to feel bad for him and try to help him out in a way that Spider-Man 2099 did not do for Miles during this movie. They introduce Hobie Brown, Spider-Punk, who is from the comics, he's played by Daniel Kaluuya, who's also in the Black Panther movie, more live action MCU actors coming as Spider-Verse people. One of the big things about the animation for his character is that he says in the movie that he hates the idea of consistency, so his character is animated in a very inconsistent way, so like sometimes he's black and white, sometimes he's in color, sometimes he's in a bunch of different types of colors. He's basically meant to be a walking version of the punk movement, which is very counterculture. He says he hates the idea of teams, so he's kind of like a force of chaos walking during the movie. During the next scene when Spot powers up with this dark matter, Miles sees the Spot's memories and his plans for the multiverse. Like I said, his plans are similar to the Beyonders plans in the more recent Secret Wars with him unmaking the multiverse. When their team is saving everyone too, this is sort of a preview for what their team is going to feel like during Spider-Man Beyond the Spider-Verse because most of these people are on that team at the end of the movie. Miles saves Spider-Man India's Captain Stacy version earning his respect but it also creates a Nexus event threatening the destruction of their universe. Because according to the canon, he was supposed to die. Jessica Drew brings a bunch of other versions of Spider-Man to try and stop the Nexus event. This is a version of the white Fantastic Four Future Foundation suit but it's a spider woman. This one with the jacket seems like he's based on the Last Stand version of Spider-Man. This six-armed Spider-Man is based on Max Born, who's from the distant future who's part of an organization kind of like this, they call the Time Spinners, they're like the TVA but with a bunch of versions of Spider-Man. This one in the armor is based on the spider armor Mark III. They go back to Spider-Man 2099's universe and show his comic, it's a scene directly from the movie not from the comics because it's from Miles Morales' comic. When the pages are flipping though, those pages are directly from the Spider-Man 2099 comics. There are a couple major versions of Spider-Man from the comics that they highlight in the lobby here but there are many 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 of them that were created just brand new for the movie that you might not recognize. This one is a female version of Spider-UK before it zooms out, there are like 10 different versions. On the left it seems like there's a version of MCU Spider-Man, kind of hard to tell because of the YouTube compression making it super blurry, talking to a version of the Canadian Spider-Man, next to them is the Velocity suit talking to what looks like the Tobey Maguire Spider-Man. Then way in the back there's a version of the classic red and blue suit just like the regular classic suit from the original comics with another black suit that might be a version of the anti ox suit. On the right it looks like the classic Iron Spider red suit talking to the Electro proof suit and another black suit that's a little too blurry to see which black suit it is. Then on the far right there's one peeking around the corner that's another red armor suit that looks kind of like a version of the classic Iron Spider suit. Then slowly zooming out a little bit at a time because there's so many versions here. In this first frame it seems like Earth 916211 Spider-Man who just wore a suit that was similar to this. Behind him I can't tell who this female yellow variant is. There was a yellow variant of the classic suit in the PS4 game that looked kind of like this. Behind her seems like a version of Spider-Girl wearing a variant suit from the Amazing Spider-Man 1000. They were from an unknown reality during that. This is the black and gold bulletproof Mark II spider armor suit talking to what looks like the Bruce Banner Spider-Man variant like the Hulk who became a version of Spider-Man and just had a white and blue costume like this. In the middle here featured very prominently is Spider-Man from the PS4 game talking to Ben Riley in a version of his ultimate costume. 
In the lower left hand corner, I'm not sure which one this red and blue symbol is, but it seems like a variant of the Velocity suit. To the right of the yellow and black suit seems like a version of the AIM Spider-Man who had been brainwashed by them. Then when you zoom out a little more, these two behind them seem like versions of Jessica Drew, and behind her is another version of Jessica Drew in the red and white suit, like a couple different variants of Jessica Drew. Zoom out a little more, this is steampunk Spider-Girl named Maybell Riley talking to another massive Peter Parker variant in a basic red and blue suit. On the left is Spider-Cop, behind him seems like the Mongaverse Spider-Man. These two girls are Spinnerette, who's a variant of Mary Jane Parker that gets powers, and her daughter with Peter Parker named Annie Mae Parker. Further to the right, there's what looks like a version of the Fear Itself suit. It's not exactly like Fear Itself, but it's pretty close. The blue suit seems like the Spider-Man Fantastic Four suit, the classic one, not the Future Foundation suit that was white. Zoom out again, you see the bombastic Bagman. Next to him, I believe, is a variant of Flash Thompson Spider-Man from the comics wearing the Midtown High Letterman jacket. This one above them seems like the classic spider armor version. Over on the right, there's another yellow and black variant of what seems like the anti-aux suit. On the far right, this red and black version seems like a variant of Superior Spider-Man. Above him, the glowing yellow and black suit is another video game suit. I can't tell exactly which one this is. This is Werewolf Spider-Man, pretty easy to spot. Above them seems like a version of Spider-Man Negative. Next to him, the all blue Spider-Man seems like another variant of Spider-Cop. The chunky Spider-Man next to him seems like another version of Earth X Spider-Man. Then when they all try to dogpile Miles Morales like they all start going at him, they're in this exact same area and most of the ones that are going after him are the ones that I just talked about that were sitting around casually. This is Anya Corazon. This is Superior Spider-Man. This is Six-Armed Spider-Man who grabs him with all of his arms along with a version of the classic spider armor. This is one of the newer spider armor suits. It could also be the Fortnite version of Spider-Man 2. This one wearing the business suit is Dapper Spider-Man, who's actually based on fan art and cosplay. Like, not all the versions, I think, in this are meant to be Spider-Man from the comics, the movies, or the games. Some of them are from real-life fan art, which seems very much in the tone of the Spider-Verse movies. Like, some of the variants are going to be the fan fiction versions of Spider-Man. Then this isn't meant to be MCU Spider-Man Tom Holland. This is still PS4 Spider-Man, the same red variant next to him in what looks like a suit from the later Secret Wars event. This is Kane over on the left, for those of you hoping that Kane would be in here. There's also Spider Monkey up top. I believe this is a new variant wearing the tracksuit in the regular shoes. All the others are ones that I just mentioned that were sitting around previously. This is the Mongaverse Spider-Man again, trying to nab him. There's some people that feel like they saw a version of PS1 Spider-Man in here. There's a version of Cyborg Spider-Woman. They did the Peter Parked car from the Spider-Verse comics. It's a living version of a Spider-Mobile created by Stan Lee in the classic Spider-Man comics and then sold as merch, like you could buy this toy. Ben Riley's Scarlet Spider is played by Andy Samberg, the joke being that he's super emo, he speaks his internal monologue, which is overly serious and super dramatic, like you would read in one of his comic books. The Spider-Horse is called Widow. He is from the comics, from an Old West universe, the reason the horse has Spider-Man powers is because he was also bit by that same radioactive spider that gave his owner powers, whose name is Web Slinger. When they go to the multiverse prisons, there are tons of cameras. There's so much stuff here. It's going to take like five more times watching the movie to spot them all. This is a version of Kraven. This is a villain named Boomerang from the comics. This is a version of Kingpin wearing a cowboy hat. There's a Dr. Octopus with actual octopus arms. This is more like the PS4 version of the character. This one in the armor is more like the female Dr. Octopus from the first movie. This is Moose Mysterio, which is a moose version of Mysterio from Spider-Ham's universe. This is a female Mysterio, they just call it Mysterio. They have a bunch of video game versions of Spider-Man, like this one seems like it's based on the very first Marvel video game ever, which was a Spider-Man game back in the early 80s. This is obviously Spider-Man PS4 from that video game with a voiceover cameo from Yuri Lowenthal. Typeface is an actual villain from the Spider-Man comics. His real name was Gordon Thomas. They have a version of the Rhino, who's just a regular rhinoceros. Then they have a Donald Glover cameo scene as the MCU version of the Prowler from the main Tom Holland Spider-Man movies. Like, after the events of Spider-Man Homecoming, he got the armor and became full Prowler. There was even a deleted scene with a live-action Miles Morales in the MCU, so hopefully they'll pay that off at some point. Spider-Punk and Gwen both say that they're the ones that caught him, and it happened recently. 
One of the reasons why he's so important to Miles Morales' character, too, is because in real life, Miles Morales was created by Brian Michael Bendis after he saw Donald Glover on the community TV show wearing a Spider-Man t-shirt, and it inspired him to create the Miles Morales character. So Donald Glover is basically responsible for Miles Morales existing in real life. Then he meets the spider bite character. She's from a universe that's like the world of Ready Player One where everyone lives mostly in a game with avatars. When she shows her real body in her home universe, it looks like she's using a PSVR headset too. This is a Sony movie, so they want that Sony product placement everywhere they can get it, like all the PlayStations you can see in this. They call this machine the Go Home Machine, but it's basically like a mechanical version of Madam Web that sends people back to their universes of origin by using their DNA. It looks like they're demonstrating it using a version of the Rhino who's based on one that wears a Rhino suit. Spider-Man 2099 then narrates his backstory. I think the fluid he's injecting into himself is just a futuristic healing device repairing his wounds. All the scenes on his monitors are just scenes from earlier in the movie like the Spot, the Lego Spider-Man's universe. You notice when they're going to see him, Spider-Punk also starts stealing bits from other machines in the room in order to make Gwen's homemade wrist device that allows her to travel the multiverse when she uses it to escape and put her team together. So the whole idea here is that going up into this, Spider-Punk believed this whole time that things would play out this way. Like, oh yeah, they're definitely going to try to escape, they're going to need some help, so I'm going to build this wrist device to help them. They want to make it seem like he doesn't have any plans, but really Spider-Punk is playing this four-dimensional chess game. He also tells Miles that he doesn't want to be on the team. Like, no, you don't want this. You should make your own team, which is a reference to the team they put together at the end of the movie. You don't want their wristwatch. You should build your own as he's building his own wrist device to give to Gwen Stacy. The whole idea with this version of Spider-Man 2099, though, is that he tried to recreate his family the same way the Kingpin did during the first movie using the multiverse. Like, he traveled to another universe, just like Kingpin searched the multiverse, to find a version of his family that was alive, but a Nexus event was caused, destroying that entire reality. That's why he thinks he needs to protect the, can the official timeline, the way that things are going on, like the sacred timeline, the way that he sees it. Peter B. Parker comes back with his new daughter, based on Mayday Parker from the comics. She was born with his Spider-Man powers, and when she gets older in the comics, she becomes a version of Spider-Woman. During the movie, he builds her a web shooter that looks like a child's toy, and she wears a baby hat that's knitted to look like a Spider-Man mask, like a baby bonnet that is a Spider-Man mask. The way that Spider-Man 2099 explains the canon theory of the Spider-Verse is basically like the Loki explainer for how Nexus events works in the timeline. When he calls it the web of life and destiny, that's right out of the Spider-Verse comics, but in the movie universe, Miles is the one who calls it the Spider-Verse for the first time. There's a bunch of Easter eggs in the different universes that they show too. The first one is from the old animated series showing the original spider bite. There's a bunch more ones depicting events from the classic comics, including the Venom symbiote suit. Like this is a bunch of versions of Eddie Brock Venom. This is Peter B. Parker watching his Uncle Ben die. This is Mongaverse Spider-Man. Most of the other versions here where they show all the Uncle Ben's dying are versions that you saw earlier in the movie. The event ASM 90 is a reference to Amazing Spider-Man 90, where basically what he says happens plays out. A version of Gwen Stacy's father, Captain Stacy, died trying to protect someone, and Spider-Man was blamed for it. We see the Andrew Garfield cameo scene from the Amazing Spider-Man movie watching his version of Captain Stacy die. Most of these other ones also depict each of the main characters' histories, but done in the comic book style. Like this is Spider-Man throwing away his costume from the comics, but it's Spider-Punk instead. This is Jessica Drew's backstory, but done in a comic book visual style. The wedding is from Peter B. Parker's marriage to his MJ after the events of the first movie, but it's done in the style of the classic Spider-Man Mary Jane marriage in the comics. They have the Tobey Maguire Spider-Man cameo scene from the events of his first Spider-Man movie. The universe here is from Spectacular Spider-Man. He even has guest speaking lines like Josh Keaton recorded new dialogue for it later. When they all walk up to listen to the rest of the speech, this is also Spider-Man Unlimited from that TV show. I didn't spot Spider-Man from the 90s animated series, but I think that he's in here too. They did pretty much every main version of Spider-Man from every medium that's ever had a version of Spider-Man. They did the big chase scene with the most epic Spider-Man pointing meme ever. I don't know how they're going to top this meme scene. The burger and fries are designed to look like Spider-Man 2099. It's also a Burger King campaign they're doing in real life for the movie. You can actually go buy Spider-Verse burgers at Burger King right now. 
During the therapy session, the whole joke is that he's getting therapy for the death of his uncle Ben. The therapist, I think, is played by Yorma Tacone because he's supposed to be in the movie. He's also part of the Lonely Island in real life with Andy Samberg, who plays a version of Ben Riley. Miles rides Widow saying hi Silver from Lone Ranger while he's attacked by the werewolf Spider-Man. I don't remember if this Spider-Woman in the wheelchair is from the comics or if she is new, but he also gets attacked by the monkey version of Spider-Man who is from the comics. When he's running through the gym too, he goes through a montage of a bunch of Spider-Man's original comic book villains from the Sinister Six. Like these are all classic versions of the characters. But the interesting thing is they have an Alfred Molina Dr. Octopus cameo seen here. It's just his voice. And the voice line is actually taken from the events of Spider-Man No Way Home. Hello, Peter. So it's sort of like this amalgam Easter egg of the original version of Dr. Octopus from the comics with the Alfred Molina version, but also the MCU movies in Spider-Man No Way Home. I think this is meant to be a joke on the Spider-Man Homecoming fairy save in Tobey Maguire's train scene. And even though there are billions of versions of Spider-Man in this, I've already talked about Spider-Cat. He's from the Miles Morales PS4 game. But the other literal and metaphorical big thing in the trailer is the version of Spider-Rex. They're actually doing a version of Spider-Rex. If you didn't read the Spider-Verse comics, Spider-Rex is just a version of Spider-Man from a prehistoric Earth in an alternate universe that got struck by a meteorite with a bunch of alien spiders, and that's how they got their powers. But it gets a little bit weirder. The origin story of those characters on that prehistoric Earth planet his original main villain is a pterodon version of Green Goblin called Norana Sorman, which is a play on Norman Osborn, but they were both in each other's bodies. The meteor strike caused their minds to switch bodies and gave them powers. During the wide shot, when they have many versions of the character, this is meant to be Metro Boomin's big cameo scene too. He did a bunch of music for the movie, but they actually turned him into a version of the character, not from the comics, like this is original to the movie, but he's the one with the joke about not having anywhere to run. There's nowhere to run. My bad, everybody. There was somewhere to run. Like I said, when Miles uses his Venom Stinger ability to suck the energy out of Spider-Man 2099's suit and then use it to blow him back, I think that's meant to be foreshadowing for one of the ways that he'll use in a more powerful way to depower the spot. Then Miles escapes using the Get Home device, except it detects the spider's DNA that bit him, sending him to its universe, number 42. In that universe, the color palette is way darker. Everything, the whole tone, the vibe of everything is way darker just because it's meant to be a universe where things went very badly because of what happened. Because the spider that was supposed to turn someone into Spider-Man in this universe, like this universe version of Miles Morales, didn't wind up biting this Miles because it came to another universe and bit the other Miles. And what wound up happening is that Earth-42 version of Miles Morales goes dark and becomes a version of the Prowler, taking the mantle from his uncle Aaron Davis. And in that universe, Miles' father is the one who's killed in the line of duty because there is no Spider-Man to stop a lot of the criminals. He sees a mural in the place where he drew one for his uncle Aaron. Like, oh no, it was my father that was the one that died in this universe. When they discover the truth, that Aaron Davis captures and straps Miles to a punching bag. It's meant to be a parallel to the first movie when Miles Morales did the same thing to Peter B. Parker when they first met. Because his skills have gotten so much better and because of what happened in that original scene in the first movie with Peter B. Parker easily escaping his trap tied to the bag, they might have a similar scene with this version of Miles Morales, now much better at being Spider-Man with his powers escaping the same type of way. Here's lesson number one, kid. Don't watch the mouth. Watch the hands. <laughs> Blame the spot for everything that's going bad in the movie. They end his part of the story in the movie with a scene of him discovering his Earth-42 self as the Prowler, who makes it seem like he's going to kill Miles as revenge for the death of his father in this universe. Like, how dare you take this from me, take my father from me. Even though, like I said, it's not Miles' fault. Like, Miles is trying to win over this alternate version of himself and Aaron Davis. Like, you have to free me because I have to stop the spot because the spot is threatening all of reality. In the movie, the spot is kind of like a version of the Beyonders during Secret Wars. He wants to basically erase the entire multiverse and remake it in his own image. While this is going on with Miles, Spider-Gwen also escapes the Spider Society base with Hobie Brown's Spider-Punk self, gives her a homemade cobbled together webware wristwatch allowing her to open portals across the multiverse, which she uses to go to Miles Morales' real universe, tell his parents some of what happened, not everything, like she doesn't outright tell them that he's a version of Spider-Man and about what's happening with the spot in the Spider-War with the Spider Society. 
Gwen then uses her wrist device to collect her own side team of Spider-Men made up of their team from the first movie in addition to Mayday Parker, who's still with Peter B. Parker in Spider-Man India. Penny Parker, Spider-Man Noir, Spider-Ham all come back from the first movie and Spider-Gwen takes them to Earth-42 to rescue Miles Morales. While this is also happening, the Spot, who at this point has consumed enough dark energy from different universe versions of the Super Collider, giving him the power upgrade to affect reality on a much bigger scale, travels to Miles Morales' original universe, claiming earlier that he was going to take everything from Miles. And they want you to think, because of the longer Uncle Ben death montage early in the movie, the Captain Stacy death montage, where there's this big talk about how they're always supposed to die in every universe, giving each version of Spider-Man their tragic origin story. They want you to think that because in Miles' universe, his father just became captain of the police, this means the spot will kill him. But a big plot point in the movie is that because of Miles' unique accident that made him Spider-Man, he can change the canon, like the way that things are supposed to happen, and it won't destroy all of reality. Because Spider-Gwen essentially does the same thing in her universe. Her father, Captain Stacy, quits his job as Captain. He isn't killed off like was supposed to happen, according to Spider-Man 2099, and her universe is totally fine. Like, oh, you can change things and it will be okay. And they end the movie with Gwen running into the portal to Earth-42 and the message just reads to be continued dot 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 in the title teaser for Spider-Man Beyond the Spider-Verse, which is part two of Across the Spider-Verse. Sort of like their Empire Strikes Back, Avengers Infinity War, part one downer ending, where you know the story's going to pick up with a year almost immediately where they left off. Right now, Beyond the Spider-Verse is supposed to come out next year. I don't know if they're going to delay it or if there are going to be any changes to that. There's also reports that we'll see some of the Spider-Verse characters cross over in live action during Avengers 6 Secret Wars. We'll see about that, but they also just announced that they're developing a live action Miles Morales Spider-Man movie and a Spider-Gwen spinoff movie with Haley Steinfeld. Let me know if you spotted any other Easter eggs or references that I didn't mention in the video. There were so many, you could watch the movie a bunch more times and still find new stuff. I'll do more Spider-Man Beyond the Spider-Verse videos soon, and let me know if you have any special requests for Spider-Verse or Spider-Man bonus videos in the comments. Everyone click here for my Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse ending and post credit scene video, and click here for that new Spider-Man 4 live-action Miles Morales announcement. Thank you so much for watching, everyone stay safe, and I'll see you guys in the next one.